after a very long illness, a woman finally died. And when she arrived at the gates of heaven, well, Peter was there to meet him, to meet her. And Peter said, okay, so here you are. And she said, wow, this is a beautiful place. How do I get in? And Peter said, well, you have to spell a word. And she said, okay, so what's the word? And he said, spell the word love. Oh, that's easy. It's L-O-V-E. And Peter said, you got it. So come on in. And so she goes into heaven. And about one year in heaven, um, she was about one year in heaven, when one, uh, that day in, uh, Peter called her and asked her to watch the gates of heaven just for a day because he is going to be occupied somewhere. And so she said, yes, okay, she's going to watch the gates of heaven and for Peter, okay? So she was guarding the gates when her husband arrived. And she said, oh boy, I'm surprised to see you here. How have you been? And he said, well, I've been doing pretty well since you died. You know, husband said to her, you know, I married that beautiful young nurse who cared for you all the while when you were ill. And I also won the lottery. And so I sold that little house that we were living in, you know, bought this beautiful mansion by the lake and, you know, for my new wife and myself. And we traveled the world. We saw everything. We had such a great time. And today, I was out water skiing and I hit my head. So here I am. <laughs> and he goes, this is such a beautiful place. What do I have to do to get in? And she said, you have to spell a word. I said, okay, what's the word? And she thought for a while. And she said, spell Worcestershire. <laughs> How many of you can spell that word? <laughs> it's Worcestershire, okay? <laughs> so aren't you glad that we get to heaven not by spelling a word, <laughs> but by the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen. Not by our achievements or by the work that we do, but by the, the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, someone once said, heaven should be our goal for one primary reason. It's forever. Amen. Forever is a very long time. Now, this has been the longest series that we've ever had, 19 weeks. And we have tackled a lot of issues, including some of the different perspectives from different scholars regarding the prophetic timing of the future. We've talked about, you know, the millennium. We've talked about the rapture. We've talked about the role of Israel and the, the times of the Gentiles and all of that. But there's one thing that all Bible-believing Christians agree on. is that everything culminates with heaven. Heaven it's the final frontier. It's where we will spend the rest of our lives in the presence of God. Heaven is a real place. It's not a figment, a figment of our imagination. It's not a state of mind. Heaven is not for good people. It's for saved people, right? It's not for the rich. It's not for the poor. Heaven is for the forgiven. We, we are all saved by grace. Amen. That's why heaven will be a surprise for a lot of people. You know, when you get there, you're going to see people, and you'll say, man, I can't believe you're here. You know, I'm shocked. Now, in turn, some of them will say to you, that's exactly what I was thinking about you. I can't believe you're here. Saved by grace to the blood of Jesus. That will be the common denominator in heaven. Now, you've probably heard a lot of weird ideas about heaven, right? Maybe you've heard some people say that when we get to heaven, we're going to be angels. Some even put it this way, you know, when somebody dies, they say, you know, he, he or she finally got her wings or his wings. Well, that's not biblical, okay? God has enough angels and he doesn't turn people into angels. Or maybe some of you have heard that when you die... When you go to the gates of heaven, somebody's going to be there. Who's going to be waiting for you? Peter, right? And you know, Peter is going to ask you some questions, and you better sure you're able to answer them, right? Like spell Worcestershire. I'm just kidding, right? 
or there are some religions that say that eventually we will all get to heaven, but you've got to get somewhere first to burn off your sins. And one day you'll eventually be pure enough so that you will be able to make it to heaven. Or here's another one. When we get to heaven, we're all going to be sitting on the clouds, right? And we will be playing our harps forever. No wonder people are not excited about heaven. You know, the fact is Randy Alcorn, who wrote a book called Heaven, he said, Satan labors to give people an inaccurate view of heaven. Our enemy slanders three things. God's person, God's people, and God's place, heaven. So, let's talk about heaven today. Okay, let's look at it from the lens and the perspective of John the Apostle as he writes it for us in Revelation chapter 21. Now, before we do that, I want to do a final review of the chronology of the timeline that we have studied from our sermon series. Okay, we studied from Daniel chapter 9, which we called Daniel's 70 weeks of prophecy. Remember that, right? And in that prophecy, we are given a panorama, panorama of God's plan that spans 490 years, where God sets apart this period of history and He gives us a preview of how He will accomplish His purposes. And in that prophecy... Daniel tells us that there's basically three divisions. The past, which corresponds to the first nine weeks. The present, which is the gap where you and I are in. And the future, which is the 70th week. By the way, the past was the future for Daniel. But for us, it's the past because it has already come to pass. And so Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, gives us this summary of what God will accomplish during the period, this 490 years. In the first 69 weeks, okay, this time frame began with the issuing of, remember that study? The issuing of the decree uh, in, to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. And in that study, we actually were able to trace that period that runs from about 444 B.C., up to 33 AD to Jesus' triumphal entry. Basically, this was a prophecy about Jesus. And that's what happened. Jesus came in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. He also predicted that the Messiah will be cut off. In other words, he will be terminated. And that's what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. And so everything is and has been fulfilled as written in this first 69 weeks. And then we also learn that there is a gap, right? We call that gap the time of the Gentiles. And Daniel tells us there are a few things that's going to happen in that gap. In that gap, after the 69 weeks, the Messiah will be killed. He prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. And he prophesied that the fate of Israel... Will, that they will never be at peace. And we know for all of that, that's true. And that gap between the 69th week and the 70th week is where we are right now. It's the church age. Okay. Now, after the 69th week, we have one of the most, you know, some of the most contentious and intriguing part of the prophecy, you know, because it's all in the future. Nobody knows how, how it's going to pan out. We don't know when. The 70th week or the last seven years is going to start but we, because it's all in the future, right? So about this 70th week, what we did was we studied what? We studied the Olivet Discourse. We studied Revelation chapter 6. We studied Thessalonians, what Paul talked about when it comes to the rapture. And as best as we can tell, you know, uh, Daniel's 70th week or the last seven years will start with the Antichrist. He will have this agreement with Israel. We don't know how that's going to look like. But in that 70 years, on the midpoint, he's going to commit what is called the abomination of desolation. And the Antichrist is going to go to the temple and he will set himself up as God. And it's going to start a period that Jesus in Matthew 24 called the great tribulation or the tribulation of Satan. And Jesus said if he does not cut it off, no one will survive. Now, we don't know how long Satan will be given 
the opportunity to pour out his wrath on the Jewish people and on Christians. But during that time, Jesus said, I'm going to cut that short. And he will do that when he breaks the sixth seal of Revelations. And when that happens, on the sixth seal, as well as in Matthew 24, we are told that there's going to be some some things that are going to happen on the heavens. There's going to be the sun, the moon, and the stars are going to grow dark. And that's in line with the prophecy of Joel, which is confirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ and John himself in Revelation chapter 6. And so in that time, when the sun and the moon and the stars grow dark, Jesus is going to come down. He's going to return, and he's going to rapture the church. And then the wrath of God will be poured out on that earth at that time, which we have called the day of the Lord, right? And this all culminates with the battle of Armageddon, and Jesus will defeat the Antichrist. And after that, Jesus will usher a millennial kingdom. That's what we studied last week, right? During the millennial kingdom, we learn that Satan will be bound at the beginning of this 1,000-year period, The earth will be rejuvenated, there will be peace, there will be prosperity. Jesus will reign for 1,000 years. And then, at the end of the 1,000 years, rebellion, right? There's going to be rebellion because Satan will be released and he's going to deceive many. And there's going to be a final rebellion and Satan will finally be crushed, right? Now, Revelation 21 also tells us about this great white throne judgment where all those names were not found in the book of life, will be thrown into the lake of fire. So this then, after all of this, okay, we're still following this chronology, after all of this, we are all ushered, those of us who are believers, and those of us who have been resurrected by that time, we will be ushered into what is called the eternal state, or in other words, heaven. That's our study for today. So, let's think about this for a bit, okay? In this particular vision in Revelation chapter 21, John, or in the book of Revelations, John has been given the privilege to see a lot of things. He was able to see the tribulation of Satan. He has seen the Antichrist and what the Antichrist would do. He has seen the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. He has seen the wrath of God poured upon mankind. He has seen the millennium. And he also has, given, has been given the glimpse of what heaven is. It's that's in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So John is an eyewitness. Okay? And I think it's much better for us to listen to what John says than to follow some idea about Peter interrogating you and asking you to spell something. Or that we're going to be sitting on the clouds and you know playing harps forever. Right? John actually tells us quite a few intriguing details that might, for us, for some of us, might be surprising. So let's look at some of, uh, some of them. Actually, we're just going to be um, talking a little bit about that. And today's message won't be exhaustive. We're just going to be looking at the first four verses of Revelation 21. But I- I'm hoping that this will encourage us and it will cause us to worship God because of what He has prepared for us. So let's talk about three realities about heaven that John tells us. Okay, And I use the word or the three words which begin with the letter D so that we can remember them easily. Okay, Destruction, design, and dwelling. So let's begin at the first one. Heaven will require destruction. Okay, That's the first reality. Some people are shocked to find that out. They're thinking... What do you mean by destruction? Let's look back to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Here's what it says. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, him, his, Jesus. From his perspective, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. So this is the great white throne judgment after the millennium, right? And this is the judgment for all the unbelievers. And it says, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found. Now, there are some, of, some people who think that John is just being metaphorical here. 
just saying that you know the sky and the earth could not stand the judgment of Christ. But I think a literal interpretation is also plausible because look at what he says a few verses later in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So after the millennium, after that 1,000-year reign of Christ where he restores the earth, this present universe will be destroyed. It will be uncreated, if there's such a word. What does that mean? It simply means that the earth, as we know it, will be completely destroyed. By the way, it's not John who says that, okay? Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says it this way. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. It says, And you, Lord, lay the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. Referring, he was talking about heaven, right? They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. Peter also says something similar in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 10. Here's what Peter says. He says, but by the time, uh, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and, the dis- and destruction of the ungodly. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That word dissolved is the word luo in the Greek. It literally means destroyed. So heaven and earth will pass away. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, right? So all of these verses tell us that there's going to be an end. There's going to be an end to this world. It tells us that the earth was actually designed by God to be temporary. And I think that's a very important truth. Now, you should be, it's true that we should be good stewards of this earth, right? We should take care of the environment. Now, if you're that, you know, save the earth kind of person, let me just tell you that you're fighting an uphill battle. Because ultimately, God is going to destroy this earth. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to take care of the environment. I'm not saying that, okay? Let's just remember that this earth belongs to God, right? And it is His prerogative to do whatever He pleases. God will completely take it out of existence. This earth, this world, the heavens and the earth are designed to be temporary, now, that is one reason why I believe, you know, remember from our study last week, I believe that there is going to be a literal millennium in this earth. Because many of the promises that God has made for Israel, for Jesus, for the nations, and even for this, you know, for the believers, have to be fulfilled on this earth. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Notice, <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, the last Part of that verse. Here's what John says, right? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. You get that? That's very interesting, isn't it? If we take that literally, it means that God's new earth, right, will not contain any big areas of salt water that spans the entire globe. Things will obviously be very different on the new earth from what they are now in this earth. Our current earth is mostly covered by water, right? But the new earth will have a different geography and likely a different climate. Some of you can't imagine that. I can't. But what's the connection with the millennium? Remember in Genesis chapter 15, God made a promise to Abraham... Here's what it says, right? Verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, 
and Rephraim, the Refra, what, what, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, Jebusites, and all the termites, right? Now, according to Genesis chapter 15, the land that God has promised to Israel included what? Everything in the Nile River, in Egypt, Lebanon, south and to the north, everything uh, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates, that's west to east. Now, from today's map, that would include everything that modern Israel possesses, but it also includes territory occupied by the Palestinians, the West Bank, Gaza, some uh, parts of Egypt and Syria, parts of Jordan, and parts of Saudi Arabia and Iraq. And those borders that God has promised you know, are, are very enormous lands. And here's the thing. Israel has never occupied all of it. Not yet. In other words, the rest of their inheritance awaits the return of the Messiah. And because we know that the new earth will be very different from this earth, it stands to reason that the promise will only be fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ. It's going to have to happen on the old earth. Why? Because God is a God of promise, right? He promised Abraham, I'm going to give you this land, and it's going to come to pass on that earth. And after which God will after the millennium, when we are in the eternal state, God will destroy this earth. Okay, so here's the question. How does that apply? We know that the earth is supposed to be temporary, right? We know that everything here will be destroyed. How does that apply then? Here's the thing. If we understand the temporariness of this world, then we should reorient our focus. And some of us, our, our minds have been so tuned to this world that we practically are living for this world. We don't consider if you know, what we are doing here on earth would count for eternity. We are so wrapped up with our earthly battles, our, our non-essential conflicts, our little corner of the world, that we cannot even get ourselves to see how our emotional responses are hurting or affecting other people. If we understand how temporary this world is, then, then we must realize that there are battles worth dying for, and there are those that are not worth dying for, right? Some of us need to forgive. Some of us need to ask for forgiveness. Others of us need to regain ground that has been lost. We need to ask ourselves, what are we living for? Remember, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God has designed this world to be temporary. And because of that, we must not let petty and trivial matters get in the way. There's kingdom work to be done. What are you living for? That's a good question to reflect on and ask. Because heaven necessitates the destruction of this current earth. And we are told in the scriptures that all of these things that we have today, they're temporary. Now, Here's the second thing. Heaven will be a fresh design. Okay, a fresh design. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you've noticed that the word new has been... Uh, has been used a couple of times here in this passage, Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And for the first heaven had, uh, and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So it says, behold, take a look. Check it out. God saying, I'm making all things new. So John tells us there's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. There's going to be a new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. Now, I cannot wrap my mind around that. I don't know what that's going to look like. But here's the idea. 
God is saving the best for last. And He cannot wait to see that look in all of our faces when He shows us that part of heaven. He's saying, Behold, take a look. I am making all things new. Now, we love new things, right? But when we buy and have these new things, it won't take long before these new things become what? Get worn out. They get scuffed. They lose their luster. They lose their shine. This word new in, in, uh, that John uses, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, all things new, is a very particular word. In the Greek, the word he uses is the word kainos. Okay? It's a very different word from the typical word that is used for new. The typical word for new is the word neos. Neos means it's, it's new, meaning something that you have never seen before, and it's chronologically new, right? The word kainos, on the other hand, means a new thing in a qualitative way. In other words, there's this fresh design. It's new in quality. It's different from this. It's different from that. It's completely different. So think about what God did for the first six days of creation. He made the heavens and the earth, right? The old, in this, um, the old earth and the old heaven. That's where we are today, right? Would you say that God did a pretty good job during the six days? Amen? Yes. Now, there are some awesome places on this earth that are breathtakingly beautiful. In six days, God did and made all of that. And when He comes back, Jesus returns, right? He's going to create, recreate or rejuvenate the earth for His millennial kingdom. Maybe He took weeks or months, we don't, we don't know. But then, in Revelation chapter 21, John says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and there's going to be a new Jerusalem. And all of this just tells us one thing, is that God has this endless capacity for creating that everything is ever and will always be new. I, I love that. God made the old one. He'll make a new one. It'll be completely and qualitatively different. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for us. I've always loved that funny story about the scientist who, who looked up to heaven and proudly said to God, God, you're outdated. You know, we scientists can do everything that you can do. And we can keep the universe running without you. And so God said, okay, let's see what you can do. And so he reached down and took a handful of dirt, blew on it, and out flew a flock of beautiful exotic birds. And so the scientist said, well, we can do that too. We've mastered the, the principles of soil manipulation and genetics, so here goes. And so the scientist reaches out to pick a handful of dirt and goes, wait a minute. You know, get your own dirt. Right? Because remember, God created earth from Nothing. And he can create the new heaven and the new earth out of nothing. It will be completely new. But here's the heart of God. Okay, that makes all of these things beautiful. Look at what it says in verse 2. It says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now that word prepared in the Greek word translates to the phrase, made ready. It means God has given this a lot of thought. It was planned by God. It was prepared by God. We have a divine architect. There's intentional design. Think about it. There were very definite planned sequential days of created creative activity during the first six days when God made the heavens and the earth, right? God is not haphazard. He is not arbitrary. And so it's not going to be a surprise that we are told that this new heaven, this new earth has been prepared. Right? Remember what Jesus said in John 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have, not, would I have told you that I go to what? Prepare a place for you. You know, hell 
is a prepared place for the devil and his angels. Heaven is prepared for you. Here's a thought. It's quite possible that this new heaven and this new earth, this new Jerusalem exists right now. It's, been, it's that God has been preparing it for, for a long, long time. And then it will be presented. And it will, uh, when the time comes, we are going to see it. And in our first breath, you know, when we first see it, it will not be something like, oh, that's nice. It's going to be something like, wow, that's awesome. Right? It's been prepared. You and I are going to see that unfold before our very eyes. And actually, John gives us a glimpse of that. Most of us have heard about the streets of gold, right? And the gates of pearl. We find that in Revelation chapter 21, verse 18. Look at what it says. It says, the wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, and the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of the single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. Now the image that John offers us here is, you know, one of the most, if the only, probably the only extended picture of heaven in the entire scriptures. Now if you ask me if I believe that to be literal true, my answer to you is yes and no. Okay. Yes, they are literally true, but no, heaven will not be anything that we imagine. It'll be greater. It'll be grander. It will be more, more awesome. Notice he says, the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. Have you ever seen gold that is transparent? It's far beyond what you and I can imagine. I love the story of a rich man. On his deathbed, he negotiated with God. That God would allow him to bring his earthly treasures with him when he goes to heaven. And so God's reaction was, this is a most unusual request. But since this man was very faithful... God said, okay, I permit you. I grant you to bring one suitcase to heaven. And so the time arrived. The man was in heaven. He presented himself to the pearly gates. And of course, Peter was there, right? This is just a story, okay? And so he was there bringing one suitcase. And this suitcase was filled with, you know, many bars of gold. Uh, Everything that he could fit in one suitcase, he was bringing it, holding it with two hands. And so as he was about to go into heaven, Peter said, wait a minute, you know the rules, you cannot take them with you. And the man said, but, but, but God said I could, God said I'm allowed to bring one suitcase. And so you know, Peter checked his computer, <laughs> found out that this is an exception that God has made. And so he prepared to let the man enter. And then he said, wait a minute, I have to examine the contents of your suitcase before I let you pass. And so he brought the suitcase, he opened it, and he saw all the gold bars in the suitcase. And Peter was saying, you brought pavement? You didn't get it, right? (laughs) Streets of gold. Okay. And when John writes about streets paved with gold, I do not doubt his words at all. I do not doubt his words at all. But he simply just reports to us what he saw in his vision. But it will be something very different. Something that we cannot even imagine or think about. Those words are literally true. But they're also something. It will also be something out of this world. Something that will far surprise us. Will even shock us. And you know it's also meant to remind us of one thing. The things that we value highly in this world. In this life will just be used to pave the roads 
in heaven. That's a city that God builds for you and me. It will be more beautiful than what we could ever imagine. So there's going to be destruction, but there's going to be a new design. And thirdly, heaven is man dwelling with God. In heaven, we will be with God in a very unique, very intimate sense. Not like here, right? Here in this world, it's God is kind of like behind the veil. And we're kind of like seeing, you know, in a mirror dimly, according to 1 Corinthians 13. We no longer have to say to one another, you know, God is present with us in His Spirit, right? In heaven, God moves into the neighborhood. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Now Wayne Grudem, um, any Bible school student will know him because he wrote this book on systematic theology. He says, heaven is the place where God most fully makes known his presence to bless. Why would God bless us? He blesses us with his presence because he's going to be with us. Now, For a lot of people, our first inclination when we think about heaven is primarily that it's a place, right? Of course, that's true. But nevertheless, I believe that there's more to it than this. Heaven, most of all, is first and foremost being in the presence of God. Consider these words from Paul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17, when it talks about the rapture. It says, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Here's what Paul says. He says, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Philippians chapter 1 verse 23. Same Paul. Same apostle. Says I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far, far better. Do you notice the longing of Paul? Right? He's saying that the best part of heaven. Will be seeing and will be being with Jesus Christ face to face. Now let me give you an illustration. Suppose, suppose you're the wife of a prisoner of war. Okay, your husband, you know, has been held captive for many years by a foreign nation. You know that your husband is alive and you hope to see your husband soon. When you know, finally, after many setbacks, after many things that you tried, an agreement, a negotiation was made with the enemy country and the release of your husband has been arranged. So imagine that, no? And the, let's just say the Philippine government had made arrangements for you to meet your husband in Hawaii after his release. There you would meet, there, would, there you would be with him for a couple of weeks before you come back home to the Philippines. Now, think about this. Hawaii is a very beautiful place, I'm told, right? Have you probably seen it on different media platforms, on TV? And I'm sure most of us would love to go to Hawaii. But for you, that place is very secondary to the person, right? If you're told that you're going to meet your husband in the Sahara Desert, you will not be disappointed. Why? Because you're there to meet your husband. The location is secondary at best, right? So while the place of heaven is beautiful... The person of Jesus should be our greatest joy. That is the reality for every Christian. Now, in light of that truth, heaven will not be a place that an unbeliever would enjoy. How would you like to spend the rest of eternity with a person that you have despised and that you have rejected? And now he is a supreme God. How would you like to forever be worshiping God, serving, serving him, spending the rest of your time with those who adore God. 
You know, the fact is this, hell is where the unbeliever wants to be. They want to be apart from God, away from God, and that's what it's going to be. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. So if the thought of being in the presence of Jesus, if that does not stir you, if that does not excite you, I have, you have to question your salvation. You have to question if you're a Christian. I don't mean to be unkind, but I think it's really worth reflecting on because scriptures always remind us, right? Test yourself if you are in the faith. Many Christians today have little desire. They have no appetite for God because they're just too attached to the present world. Let me share to you one, uh, the thoughts of one pastor. He, this is his experience. He said, you know, he said, when I was growing up, my greatest desire was to be old enough to have my driver's license and to drive legally. I had driven on my parents' property for several years, but I could not drive on the highway. Now look at what he said. He said, whenever I heard someone preach about the return of the Lord, I was uneasy because I feared that God would come before I was able to drive. And it says, the humor in all of this is that I, I drove, um, I arrived back from Dallas after driving nearly 6,000 miles, and that drive was not heaven. Nothing on this earth is worth heaven's weight. Now, you know, when I read that, I, I thought about the different versions of that, that perspective from a lot of believers today. You know, some of the youth, the younger ones will say, you know what, Lord, don't come back yet. So I haven't seen my lifetime partner. Or they will say, Lord, don't come back yet. I want to enjoy my career first. The older ones might say, Lord, I want to see my children get married first. I want to see them settle down, hopefully even see my grandkids. Don't come back yet, Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong to long for you know, these things per se. But how does it compare with Paul's longing for God? When Paul said, you know, we would rather be away from the body and be at home with God. The Lord. It would be good for us to really think about that. Do we really long for Jesus? Do we really desire to be with Him? Because if not, you know, verse 4 of Revelation 21, which is one of the most comforting verses in the scriptures, won't mean anything to you. Look at what it says He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. A lot of us, when we read that verse, we focus on what? On the things that have been a burden for us in this life, right? We are happy to, to know that when we get to heaven, there will be no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, you know, no more curse. I want you to notice again. How personal verse 4 is. Look at the first part. It says what? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Who's going to do that? God is. If you don't care for God, that won't mean anything. Amen? Can you remember those tears in your life? Heaven will be a place where God will be with His people. It's a place that you and I will be with Him. And more than the streets of gold, more than the, the beautiful elements that we see about the description of heaven, it will be the beauty of God and His very presence that will be our greatest joy and delight. And many of us long for heaven because we're tired. Perhaps because there are so many sorrows that we face. Perhaps the difficulties of life are just a burden for us. The mental anguish that we go through. Maybe the physical pain that we're feeling, especially if we're sick or if we're getting old. We long for those things to be taken away. Yes, we all have those longings. But the real joy of heaven is the presence of God. He will wipe 
every tear away. And in the grand scheme of things, you know what? Nothing else really matters. Amen. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That's what heaven is all about. Heaven, yes, it will mean destruction for this old earth, the old heavens. The new heavens will be a great design, a fresh new design from God. But ultimately, heaven is about us dwelling with God forever. I remember J.B. Phillips, an Anglican clergyman who wrote the Phillips translation of the Bible. You know, Philip, uh, J.B. Phillips' ministry happened in London, England during World War II. During those times, as he was serving as a clergyman, World War II, he conducted over 5,000 funerals. Can you imagine 5,000 funerals? But you know, he never described a dead believer as the dearly departed. Right? Have you ever heard a, a minister say that? You know, Our dearly departed. He never said that. He always spoke of believers, those believers who died as those who have arrived. I like that. Not the dearly departed, but the man or the woman who has arrived. So if ever you have, a, you know, I do, I do your funeral, I'll try to remember that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you as one who has arrived because that's what it's going to be. You will arrive. The believer who dies really just falls asleep only to awaken to see the face of our Savior. You and I will be truly alive when that time comes. In heaven, we are just given a small glimpse of that here in the scriptures. But we cannot imagine what it will be like. 19 weeks, right? Living in the last days. I hope you enjoy the series. As we close, I want to leave you with this thought. Here's the thought. It's that no one goes to heaven by accident. Heaven is God's prepared place for a prepared people. And the point is this. You and I prepare for heaven. And God prepares heaven for us. You know, most people today believe in heaven. And most of people think that they're, they're going to go there. But the question is, are they on the right road? Are they building their lives on Jesus Christ, the solid rock? A lot of people, I fear, are standing on sinking sand and they don't know it. What is your hope for heaven? The better question is, who is your hope for heaven? Let me tell you, my hope for heaven is Jesus Christ. I have staked everything I have on him. Because if Jesus cannot take me to heaven, I'm not going to be able to go to heaven. I have too many sins. I have too many failures. I have too many things, too many skeletons in my closet. If Jesus cannot bring me to heaven, I will never get to heaven. But you know what? If you know Jesus, you have nothing to be afraid of. For those of you who have never given your life to Christ, I encourage you, put your trust in Jesus. Run to the cross. Stand your full weight on the solid rock of our salvation. And my prayer is that God will grant that we will all meet one day in heaven. Amen? And when that time comes... We will be home. We will be in heaven at last. In the very presence of God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises. That we have in you. Thank you for the truth. 
of your word that we can hold on to. And we believe, O oh God, that you have prepared such a beautiful place for us. But not just that. You, we will be with you, Jesus, forever in your presence. Everything is all about you. This life means nothing apart from you. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can hold on to your word. We can hold on to your promises. And today you have given us a small glimpse of what it will be. But praise be to you and to you alone. You are God. and You are a wonderful God. Thank you, Lord, for today's word. In Jesus' name, amen. And Amen.